does that strike you intuitively what's wrong with me saying that, calling this the first touch of the trend line? Pretty meaningless. Same person would play that game all day long. Markets, weather does, weather does not have straight lines in it. Fluid dynamics does not have straight lines in it. Um, the Kardashians and everything coming out of Hollywood do not have straight lines in them. Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Traders Mind Chat where we talk to professional traders from around the world to get into their mindsets of how they become successful, why they think what they think, and that uh, so that way they could help us and some of their wisdom and knowledge can bleed into ours and we can be as profitable uh, as we possibly can be. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Kevin Cook. Kevin and I have been following each other on social media now, I think for uh, years, uh, on, on Twitter, on stock tweets. Kevin uh, was an institutional Forex market maker for 10 years, trading 100 million per day to provide spot and futures liquidity to the biggest banks and hedge funds in the world. Once the machines took over Forex arbitrage, he spent two years at options powerhouse Peak Six, developing their derivatives education. Since 2011, he has been doing equity research and analysis at Zach's Investment Research, where he runs model portfolios like his healthcare innovators service. Kevin, welcome to Traders Mindshed. Good to join you, Michael. Uh, so, yeah, you had published uh, an incredible article about why trend lines are mathematically absurd. And, and I wanted to, to get into that a little bit more because uh, for years, uh, I, I've been a practitioner of, uh, of using trend lines. Uh, I've studied O'Neill, Minervini, uh, various other market wizards and have used trend lines in my trading for, uh, for over a decade. Uh, and so uh, when I first read your, or heard about your article, uh, like uh, I, was, I was immediately intrigued. Right? Like uh, I'm, I'm, I like being open uh, to, to everything and always hearing the other side of the, the story. So that way it can help broaden our perspectives. And I think the greater awareness that, that we all have, uh, the better we'll, we can perform too. And as a coach, I think that it's a good idea to have that kind of open-mindedness as well. So, uh, so I'm thrilled to have you here on the show. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm glad you did. And as a coach, it kind of makes sense that you would be that flexible and open-minded. I have, I know a lot of prominent technicians who, when they heard my thesis, went, uh, you don't understand what we do. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, and then I started to, I, I was looking through your, your video. Uh, again, the, the video was fantastic. Uh, I, I think that uh, more sh people should be looking at that video too, because it, well, 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 one of the big things that, that I got out of it too was it seems like a lot of people simply misuse trend lines. It, it's not that uh, they're like completely not like, uh, it, it's not a, It's not as though they have zero use, but the, they're improperly used. It, it seems like is sure. or am I uh, misinterpreting what? No, you're no, saying? no. I, I mean, um, if, if people are aware of some of the logical fallacies, um, then uh, then they can still use them. You know, it, it, there, there's still a there still can be a tool in the toolbox, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, are Are we showing my screen right now? Are we showing your screen? Um, yes. Yes. So I'm. Sh so here's the article. Trend lines are mathematically absurd. Yep. Which I published in December 2017. But um, and this has the video at the bottom of it. So for anybody who just goes to medium.com and looks for Kevin B. Cook, um, you're you know you'll be able to find this. And and I review the original post I put on StockTwits. In fact, what I did is I this was the the snapshot that I put on StockTwits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, killing the sacred cow of technical analysis in 400 words. And, but I found that 400 words wasn't enough, so that's why I did this longer article. Um, and then in 2016, I also did this video, which you can mm -hmm. find it on YouTube or, again, here on Medium. So this is the video that Michael's talking about. It's 17 minutes long, so I go into a few details, you know, a few different angles, and that hopefully we can cover a few of those angles today. Cook's Kitchen, I love that. 
So um, can I just tell you a little bit about my background, other than what you read, that, that will sort of lay the groundwork here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna, I, everybody should know that I, I, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a quant. In fact, I failed most of my math classes in high school and college. I really struggled with math. But when I came into the markets, and I'm, I'm sitting right across the, the river here from the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, where I started in 1994, when I walked onto that trading floor and saw the front lines of capitalism, I, I was, you know, I was swept away. I'm like, this is what I have to do for a living. And so I just started picking up all kinds of books, talking to traders, and I realized the one thing that I was going to have to do differently with my life was get some fundamental math skills going. And so in my, and, and this was when I was 29 years old. So I had to teach myself probability and statistics in my thirties. Um, and that paid off because then I eventually got a chance to be uh, a currency trader. Um, and then I also studied options. Um, it, any options trader should know the, the options Bible is um, options, volatility and pricing by Shelley Nattenberg. Uh, I was fortunate to take courses from him right across the river here. Um, and really started diving into that and where probability and, and stats are, are vital too. Um, and then that's how I got the, sh the shot to work for one of the biggest options uh, uh, firms in the world, which is Peak Six here in Chicago. And, and, and around the same time, a very important book came out right before the financial crisis called The Black Swan by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Most people know the book, but most people I talk to haven't read the book. Um, and I went out of my way to read it in uh, 2007, 2008, and it just, it blew my mind, but only because I'd done the homework first. Like, like I say, um, you know, so when I was 20 years old or even 25 years old, I was allergic to algebra. You know, I would stare at math equations and, you know, couldn't get anything out of them. But once I started teaching myself about the foundations of probability that make uh, the stock market what they are, what make Las Vegas what they are, then it just sort of took off for me. And then I could calculate standard deviation and understand standard deviation. And, and then when you read Taleb's book, you're like, holy crap. He's saying that, you know, the bell curve and standard deviation are a great intellectual fraud because you, because you can't apply them to markets. Now we do as volatility traders with options. Um, if you're a volatility trader with options, of course you, you uh, are charting implied volatility versus historical volatility and, and, uh, and, and trying to make, make your money that way, lock in uh, profits and that kind of thing. But what, what Taleb and his mentor, Benoit Mandelbrot taught us is that standard deviation cannot be used to tell you about the risk in financial markets. And they were right because we found that out with the CDOs and uh, the mortgage-backed securities, uh, you know, by 2008 when the market imploded, is that the risk on those instruments was being measured incorrectly using standard deviation historical volatility. So, um, you know, once I realized that I could actually do math, it, it was sort of an insatiable uh, curiosity for me. And I like to say that, um, you know, I had to work harder than everybody else at it. So, so I'm just setting the table here about how hard I had to work at math. And so when I see something that's mathematically absurd, I get excited about it. Um, so you don't need to be a math whiz in order to exactly it. Exactly. That, and that, so, so trend lines then would be, uh, as mathematically absurd as saying as oh, one plus two equals five. To me, yes. Yes. Because, okay. and, and, and let's start with something that most people can agree on, even if they're using uh, trend lines right now. Um, okay. So I'll see, uh, I'll see if I can draw one here that's, uh, okay. Here, this is perfect. So this is the IGB, this is the, uh, the software ETF. Um, you know, it's, it's cap weighted, so Microsoft, Salesforce, Adobe are the big weights here. Now, I drew a trend line, and this is a weekly chart. So I uh, went off the December 18, 
lows, and then uh, and then I touched the June swing lows to create this trend line. What I the first thing I noticed that a lot of trend line drawers do is that they'll draw this trend line and then they'll talk about see here was the first touch of the trend line. Mm -hmm. Does that strike you intuitively? What's wrong with me saying that, calling this the first touch of the trend line? Yeah, so uh, from, from what I've learned uh, about drawing trend lines, like you want to have at least three touches, right? Like the more the better uh, right. in, in order to have any sort of significance at all. Like if it's just like two points, uh, like that, that's, uh, yeah. uh, the, it's pretty meaningless. So where I'm going with this, and let's say that this extended farther, and let's say this thing had five touches. Right, right. When the, when the person who drew this with the ruler, so to speak, calls this the first touch, they're committing a logical fallacy known as a tautology. The okay. trend line cannot exist until it connects two points. So the line did not even exist until it got to here. So no touches count until after the thing that created it. So, they, right? so, so this, where, so where right. I am right now, that would be considered the first touch. Um, here would. So that's the first touch. When would you right. start to consider it mathematically significant then? <laughs> if, if at all. <laughs> but, like, could it um, be? I, don't, I don't know if we're going to get there, but, but let's just, you know, I, I'm starting right. easy on, on the the trend line people here and, and giving them something they could probably agree with that this is a, this would be a logical fallacy to call this the first touch when the trend line didn't even exist until you connected two points. Okay. okay. So, and, and what that reveals, and, and I noticed this, um, the, the, the thing that I posted on stock in 2015, um, and you know, Howard Lindzen, right? Mm -hmm. I, um, I was chatting with Howard Lindzen and this other prominent technical trader who I shall not name. And he kept do he kept making this logical fallacy. And I'm like, that's it. <laughs> and that's when I posted my, my 400 word uh, attempt to kill the sacred cow. Because when I, the reason I call trend lines the sacred cow is because what is the Bible for tech, technical analysis as you know it? The Bible for technical analysis. Yeah. Oh. The Bible that's in its 11th edition. Uh, Very well, old. Hey, you know, well, uh, like, like for me, uh, like I'm such a champion of, of O'Neill, right? Yeah. Uh, like, the, well, like to me, like that, that's my Bible. But like, uh, like for you, uh, like I know that it's something else. Yeah, the one that, the one that goes way back would be um, Edwards and McGee. Yep. Yeah, everything comes from Edwards and McGee. And because Edwards and McGee got out the rulers and drew straight lines on charts, everybody's still doing it. And so it's, it, to me, it's sort of like a holy sacrament of the church of technical analysis. And that's the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be re-examined. Some things need to be re-examined. This is one of them. So um, what, I, what I realize is that people are just, because they want to make money and they pick up a chart and they figure out, oh, gee, I can make money by trend following, um, they may not have the requisite math skills to really survive. Like, I bet you, you teach your, uh, your clients how to, um, how to look at their trades in terms of probability, and risk management, you know, very math-based things that oh, yeah, you need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, so well, so what, what it reveals massive. immediately when somebody doesn't even know how to draw a trend line is that right away they're missing, you know, basic logic is missing from their approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to, let's dig a little deeper. So that's the third reason, and the least important is, is the logical fallacies. Um, you know, where people get into a tautology. Right, right. Now, the second thing is that people, trend lines can be so subjective. Where do you, where do you connect the, the points? Do you connect them from, I'm using a weekly chart here, and I don't even know if I've got this exactly on the low. Do I use the low on a weekly chart? Do I, do I have to use it on a daily chart? Um, those, those are all questions that become very subjective. And so right away, you're, um, let's compare this to something that's very mathematical and most everybody can agree on. If you use a standard setting in RSI or stochastics or MACD or some other momentum oscillator, pretty much 
everybody's going to have the same numbers, right? Yeah. As long, as long as we have the same data from our data provider of what stocks did, then all of our oscillators um, and momentum indicators are going to be about the same. You know, now you can use them differently, but they're, you know, the, the data going in is the same and the, cal the mathematical calculation per your settings, if you're using standard settings, will be the same. Obviously, everybody likes to change their settings. Well, that's all math based. But when people draw trend lines and, and subjectivity enters in, and then they start telling themselves, well, this trend line is significant for this reason, you, you're getting into too much subjectivity. So that's, the, that's sort of the, the, the second reason that, uh, that I find trend lines are mathematically absurd. So what if, a, what if you're using it as a secondary or a tertiary uh, thing to confirm a pattern? So uh, is, is there a way for you to remove well where it says trade directly from your chart? Yeah, sure, sure. Thing? This is, I'm not, a, I, I don't have a, a subscription to a trading view. So, um, but yeah, you want to draw a trend line way back? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, like I, I was actually going to go uh, even closer, right? Like, so uh, kind of out, like, and I haven't uh, analyzed this chart, but well, one of the things that uh, like this kind of popped out as a potential double bottom, right? And so like if that's a double bottom, then uh, that this point right here is the, the pivot of the double bottom. Now, I love what you're doing right there. And the reason I love it is because you're not trying to be precise. You're not trying to exactly grab this price low point and that. You're drawing what we would call patterns, and you're looking for, um, you know, uh, you know, do we have a higher low? Do we have a lower low? Mm -hmm. And then, and then, what would be meaningful? What would be a meaningful break of resistance on the upside? I, right. This I like. So to me, this this is not this is not mathematically sound. It's it's about price behavior. Mm, and, and that's what we, and that's what we do as 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 people who look at charts. We are analyzing what is the crowd doing, and you know uh, which way is sentiment going, and is it you know is it oversold, is it overbought, you know are we going to overcome resistance, are we going to make a higher low, you know all these things. Those are still a little bit subjective, but they work because we can see patterns on the chart. So when you draw. When you draw a pattern with lines, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Mm -hmm. But what I have a problem with is the straight line through time. And my biggest example is going to be how many times have you heard in the past five years? Well, Michael, if you draw, if you look at the S&P on a, a 10 year weekly chart and you draw a line from the uh, March 2009 lows, <laughs> you know, we haven't broken trend. I mean, that to me is the ultimate example of absurdity that a straight line through 10 years and billions and billions of economic events has any meaning for what the price is going to do next in a bull market. Well, well let, let me add this line here, right? I'm going to draw it in blue. So like part of what I'm seeing is this, right? Mm -hmm. So what if that is part of the analysis for like, oh, well, uh, you know, where I, like, the entry point might be over there if you're buying it off of the double bottom, mm -hmm. but you also broke above that uh, descending trend line. And, and so like it's getting, it's breaking through multiple potential areas of mm -hmm. resistance. Uh, like, uh, do you have a problem because it's the downward slope? Or no, not at all. Not at all. I think that's fine because you didn't, you're, you didn't draw it looking for pinpoint precision. Ah, you okay. just, you just drew it like, like I, you could do it with a Sharpie, right? Yeah. If you can do it with a Sharpie, I'm fine with it. But in here, you just did a quick line because what you're doing is you're visually identifying trends. And I talk about all of this in my article. Um, yep. So if you go through the whole article, you can see I talk about that. Um, oh, I lost your, uh, I lost oh, your okay. drawing. I put it back. Oh, there we go. Woo -hoo. Um, so yeah. uh, I, I, I think this is great because uh, what it means is you are a visual trader who uses patterns to tell him about supply and demand. And supply and demand is really all about psychology, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So you have given us a visual picture of the psychology of the market and supply and demand at this moment in time, which is basically um, 
which was basically uh, Q4 of last year, mm-hmm. and when everything was melting down, um, we, you know, smart traders were looking for bottoms and lots of things, or mm-hmm. opportunities and lots of things. And if you weren't buying in December, then you probably didn't know what you were doing. Um, but yeah, so what you drew here is just, you're just rough. I could do this with a Sharpie and go, all right, this is the visual picture I'm looking at. Yeah. Do I want to be early and buy here do, or do I want to wait for a big confirmation getting above this bar, you know, and especially because I totally believe in horizontal lines, you know, cause to me, a horizontal line is about price memory. A horizontal line is saying what happened in the, what happened at a level in the past, right? And so this blue line, I don't have a problem with it at all because you weren't looking for precision. It's just a, it's just a picture. So it's like, um, you know who uh, Bolkowski is? Bolkowski, no. Oh my God, he's I like, uh, one thing. he's, uh, so um, uh, who's, who's the old uh, technician who runs stock charts? The old guy, um, uh, John, I forget his name. But anyway, Bolkowski is like sort of in the shadows. He's got, you know, and he's got, uh, I think his website is pricepatterns.com. So he'll give you, he'll explain to you all the, uh, the triangles and the head and shoulders and this and that. Um, I, I say you can still use the patterns, just don't get precise about them. And especially, so let's do, let's do the, uh, what I think is one of the biggest sins, and then I'll explain why. So oh, and, uh, before we move on to that, I, I actually have one more question about, about, about this chart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I'm curious, like, so it, if, Price memory is okay for a horizontal line. How come it's not okay for uh, if I only had, uh, say, uh, that descending trend line? Like if I just drew this, uh, like why is, why is this not price memory? Aha, uh-huh. that's an excellent question. That, that is the million dollar question, Michael. And if I can, if I can answer it to your satisfaction, and a light bulb goes on for you, then I will feel like, you know, this was a very, <laughs> this was a killer event, right? Because that's- I'm already that's getting the, tons of value, so I'm excited. Well, like, the, I know that why- That is the question that. I have to answer. What was that? Uh, well, like, maybe that point right there, because now you have the trend line that's, uh, like, that, that's just the second point. Or like, you have a uh, point here, and then point there. Okay, now you have something that you could draw down. So like if this got rejected down here, <clears throat> then. Okay, so um, uh, no, I'm gonna. Yeah, no, walk, walk me through. Like, this yeah, is what I, I have to, yeah. This is exactly what I have to answer. So first of all, I'm gonna draw one. I'm gonna go back here in December of 2017 and Oh, if I got my, let me make sure I got my thing on here. Okay. Okay. So you see what I did? I went back to December of 17 and I took that low Mm -hmm. and I drew a horizontal line. Right, right. That horizontal line has price memory going back to December of 2017. And all I wanted to use it for was to see what subsequent price action would do. And what did I get? I got one of the most beautiful things that traders dream of, the confirmed higher low, right? right. I mean, if you're, if you're buying the dips, this is what you wanna see. It, 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 didn't even, it didn't even touch it, no double bottom. We got a confirmed higher low on a weekly chart, we're off to the races. So okay. this was, my horizontal line was price memory. So my job is to be able to tell you why um, angular lines uh, across swing highs and swing lows do not have price memory. All right. Got it. So let me, let me get, um, let me go back a little bit to, well, I'm going to go back to Taleb okay. and the Black Swan and Mandelbrot. Okay. Um, in, well, uh, I don't know if you've read any Taleb, but in 2001, he published Fooled by Randomness. Okay. Now, uh, I, was, I was really working hard in the 2000s as a currency trader, and I was also doing some coaching of other traders, and I built this trading simulation. Um, I should, yeah, 
I should share that, that what I realize is you can't give somebody psychological discipline in the markets, you know, because we all come to the markets with our own flaws and our, we see what we want to see, right? You cannot remake somebody's mind and give them psychological discipline and teach them how to be a good planner, teach them how to manage risk, that kind of thing. What I thought I could do, though, is if I could just teach somebody the mechanics of probability and risk in a simulation where the only way they could win is by following the rules or they would constantly blow up their account, um, that I could help them internalize it. I called it risk software for your brain. Mm, okay. So that's what this simulation was. <clears throat> because at the core of it, what I was teaching them was randomness. Now, I didn't really read much of Taleb's first book, Fooled by Randomness. Um, if I had, it probably would have benefited me more. But I dove into the Black Swan. And, what, and, and his, his mentor, Benoit Mandelbrot, wrote a book called The Misbehavior of Markets. And what ben, Benoit Mandelbrot uh, became a mathematician, and then he started studying markets. What he said is markets have a unique characteristic. There is no standard deviation. There is, but the, the tails are fat, right? When you look at a bell curve, the tails can be very fat. And so that basically makes um, standard deviation useless. So Mandelbrot described the markets as having wild randomness. Wild randomness means anything can happen out of the blue. During the financial crisis of uh, 2008, 2009, the VIX went to 80. And the reason that the VIX went to 80 is because we were having 5% moves in a day. And 80 is the standard deviation for volatility one year annualized. But on a daily basis, that's 5%. And, and we were having 5% moves. Um, nobody could have predicted that. In fact, nobody did. And, and even Taleb will say you can't predict the black swan. But he saw it coming because he published that book before the crisis. So you have to think about why markets have wild randomness and anything can happen mm -hmm. and when you start thinking that way um it, you know it, it's because markets are the most complex dynamic systems on the planet i'm going to repeat that because i think it's very important i want everybody to think about it markets are the most complex dynamic systems on the planet they're more complicated than any physical phenomena and they're more complicated than any social uh, uh, construct, you know, any, any institution. There is no institution that man has created that is more complex than markets because there's so many variable inputs and then so many things can happen, right? Um, and, it, and it's affected by political news and, uh, you know, who knows what. Um, so trying to tame that beast is, is what we try and do as traders. But we, we try and do it within our control. I bet you at any given time, uh, you're not, you don't have 100 open positions. In, Absolutely not, no. Right, because that would be way too much to manage. You would need us, you would, if you were going to do that, you'd want to have a staff of 10 people, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's what the big firms do. So, and um, uh, one, of the, one of my favorite big firms is Renaissance Technologies. You know who Renaissance is? Uh, I've heard the name. You, and you probably are going to, you've been hearing the name Jim Simons a lot more too, because somebody just, somebody just wrote um, a story about Jim Simons. He was a mathematician. I, I don't know if he was an engineer. No, he was a math professor. He had no interest in the markets in the late 70s. He came into the markets and he's like, hmm, I could do some stuff here. And Renaissance Technologies became this, one of the first real algo hedge funds. So he, and, and he would hire engineers, uh, you know, aerospace engineers, um, you know, chemists. He wanted really smart people who were quantitative and just let them create trading models and, and thus the, the algo explosion. So um, I can guarantee you this, Renaissance Technologies is not using trend lines. You know, they're using all sorts of, momentum indicators and oscillators and price behavior, volume behavior, but they're not using trend lines. Now, so let me see if I can I'm gonna take a crack at making this point about why this trend line um, does not have price memory. Okay. Um, 
and, and usually I do this with the long-term S&P chart, but I'll start here and maybe it'll become more clear with the, with the long-term okay. S&P chart. Okay. So from, uh, so basically Q4, October 1st um, of last year, software peaked and then did all this. Okay, so you, you decided or somebody decided, I'm gonna connect this high with this swing high and now I have a trend line that's gonna give me information about the future. Fine, okay. it can give us visual information as I indicated, but it doesn't have price memory because um, there is nothing about uh, this swing high that was determined by this swing high, okay? You, you um, I mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. Yeah, somebody could argue it, but I would say, what, th this swing high got here for whatever reason it did, whether it was news or short covering or, um, or, and actually a lot of randomness. That's how this got here. And it had nothing to do with that. So you can't tell me that there's price memory in this line now when. Yeah, not, not there. Anyway. <coughs> hmm? Yeah, not, not at that point. Well, well, but if if <clears throat> if this if this swing high was not determined by this swing high, then how could any subsequent swing high be determined? You know, you're using a straight line through time. Okay. Now the problem with the straight line through time, if you took any physics classes, mm -hmm. is that time bends, right? If you know anything about Einstein or Niels Bohr, or Werner Heisenberg, or, um, or Richard Feynman, <clears throat> these guys will teach you that the universe is curved, mm -hmm. and time and space bend, right? And so, <clears throat> we're, we're going to go now, we're going to go to the big chart. Okay, let me clear this. <clears throat> Uh-oh, coffee. <laughs> All right. So... Let's see. Um, uh, give me a one month chart. So that, yeah, that'll take me back. Nice. Okay. Oh, I got some old fibs on there. <laughs> I do use fibs. I use fibs because they are mathematical. <laughs> All right. So here's the trend line that everybody and their mother loves to draw. <laughs> Oh, let's see, are they gonna connect? Yeah, they'll probably connect that 2011 low, yeah. <clears throat> oh yeah, so I guess it looks like something like this. On the monthly chart, if you connect the March 09 low with the 2011 low, you get something that roughly looks like this. Whoop, I didn't clamp that baby down. See, I'm, I'm not good at using trend lines, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's no wonder why. All right, so, so, so then during, do they have memory, like if price fell back down and came to uh, to somewhere, I don't know about like down here. Uh, where are you pointing? Um, like down. Uh, okay, okay. So, so you want? Okay, so you're asking me, isn't there price memory there? Okay. So let's let's back up a second here. So let me just let me just do let's pretend we're only in 2016. Okay. I should, let me see if I can get rid of this fib nonsense. Fibbies, come on! I want. Uh, uh, double click on them, or or click okay. off of this. Let's see. I got to get rid of that. Yeah, click okay, off so, of your. So. Drawing. So double click no. on the. Uh, Actually, not click off of your drawing. Click the, the crosshair in the left sidebar. Okay. And then go click on the drawing. Uh, yeah, click on the fibs. Okay. And click delete. Okay, good. Well, and I got another one in there, but we won't worry about that one. Okay, so here, this is the, this is the earnings recession of 2015, 2016. Remember, energy was melting down, and we thought, um, oh, all these energy, bunch of energy companies are going to go belly up because the price, right, of right. Oil, price of oil went to 30, and the frackers were just getting killed. And um, I I got caught up in that recession fear a little bit, but hey, the Fed was there for us. So, 
But during this time, <clears throat> what you heard all the prominent chartists talking about was, hey, and I better keep an eye on the time here. What kind of time we got? Uh, right now it is 12.40. So uh, like okay. anybody, if it, anybody that's in the room, if you have questions as we're going, type them into the yeah. chat. And we'll, we're going to open up the floor and answer sure. every question that yeah, you have. Let me, let me finish this one part, and then we'll take any questions. So <clears throat> um, what the Chartists were saying here was, well, the bull market is still intact as long as we stay above this trend line that was formed from 2009 through 2011. And mm -hmm. I was like, give me a break. You know, <clears throat> that this line has nothing to do with anything because what happened – between <clears throat> the fall of 2011 and we'll say the, the winter of 2016, you know what happened? Billions and billions of economic events right. around the world. I mean, commodities, interest rates, wars, uh, politics, uh, it, you know, death by Amazon, I mean, the, the, the amount of innovation, wealth creation, and some wealth destruction was absolutely frigging incredible in those five years. So why would a straight line through time define anything? You know, it, it's, it's, traders want it to be simple. And they want to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I can't keep track of billions and billions of economic events. So I'm going to simplify everything with a simple line that tells me, oh, if it stays above here, or goes below here, that means something. And I, and I you know, I, I just, markets are way too complex. I mean, this is, why, this is why we even talk about black swans is because that's how complex and dynamic markets are. And, and I'm not going to say that markets are unpredictable, but there is so much randomness that I mean, I don't know if you teach this to your traders, Michael, but um, I used to teach, listen, you can win with a 55% win rate as long as you make sure your winners are bigger than your losers. Yeah. Well, how can I make sure my winners are bigger? Well, you can make sure your losses are small, right? So that, that's the equation. It's that, it's that how often do I win and then how much smaller do I, my losses need to be than my winners? And so, so, and let's say you taught them, let's say you, you taught somebody to be half of a good trader. Half of a good trader would always cut their losses short. But if they don't let any winners run to be bigger than their losses, they'll never make it because they'll, they'll never be able to stay in the game. And you know this. Uh, right, exactly. Well, like, a, it, it, like, look at Babe Ruth. Right, uh, like the uh, uh, biggest strikeout champion uh, uh, in history, <laughs> one of the biggest, and also held the, the home run record simultaneously. Uh, why, right? Because uh, like he was able to have uh, like those big, big winners, and yeah, like he was willing to strike out to make those big winners happen. It's the same thing. Like if you flip the coin, right, and you got paid two dollars. Every time it lands on heads, then you lost a dollar every time it lands on tails. Well, the same person would play that game all day long. Right, right. So, and what I find with people who still want to use trend lines and, and, and think that they can draw a straight line through billions and billions of economic events, not only do they want it to be simple, <clears throat> but they also probably haven't expanded their math and science education that much. Because if you go into anything, like I, I mentioned uh, four physicists, Einstein, Bohr, Heisenberg, uh, Feynman, you, you study people like this and you understand how the universe really works, it's everywhere. So let's use weather as an example. Um, you know, do, if we have a question, I'll take a question. Oh, yes, yes. Well, we actually have two questions uh, that Great. came in. Um, the first one was from Ian. Uh, uh, do trend lines work simply because lots of people believe that they do? People react to what they think works. And yes. yes, they do. And there's nothing wrong with still using them because of that, right? Mm. Um, you know, so, so if it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, there's nothing wrong with that. If you, 
Because what you're really doing then is you're still playing the crowd psychology, mm. which is where you want to be. If you're if you're gonna if you're gonna take on the house, so, you're pl you're playing against the crowd psychology. So if I'm understanding you right, you so using a trend line is okay from a psychological perspective, playing it that way. But if you're like this, this is mathematically sound, then it's like come on, man, get out of here. Yeah, and there's so many better tools to use. Like you know what I use for trend. Um, uh, moving yeah. averages. Yeah. Yeah. Because a moving average, it's more fluid. And then yeah. the reason I brought up the physicists again is that when you study weather, when you study anything to do with fluid dynamics, those will teach you how markets work. Markets, weather does, weather does not have straight lines in it. Fluid dynamics does not have straight lines in it. Um, the Kardashians and everything coming out of Hollywood do not have straight lines in them. Anything that drives people to buy an iPhone or to post something on Instagram, there are no straight lines. It, it's fluid dynamics, it's weather. So look at weather modeling. This is one of my favorites. And, and um, uh, I got my pilot's license when I was 16 years old. So I was studying weather when I was 15. And everybody, everybody criticizes the weather person. Oh, they always get it wrong. But, but really, the, most of them are using the same weather models. And the weather models are, are just getting better and better all the time, right? Because what do, they, what do they benefit from? They've got massive data input, and then, they, and then they keep getting to see the historical patterns. But we, try and we think that the markets are like weather, where we can just put in the data and look at the historical patterns, and history will repeat. Well, in, in weather, history repeats. But in markets, we're lucky if it rhymes. You know? um, and it doesn't mean that patterns don't work, but um, because, because look at really what we're playing is um, when, we, when we buy a swing low that we think is extremely oversold because players are overreacting emotionally, I mean, that's our thesis, right, is this thing is oversold mathematically, like it's down, you know, 40% in a month for no reason, um, and it was in reaction to a news item where people were overreacting on extreme fear. And that's when people like you and I step in and go, this is a buy. That's what I did with the trade desk back under 190 um, a month ago. And I was able to do it with a lot of stocks because I watched them closely and then I analyzed the fear and greed, not because I used a trend line. Interesting. Got another so, question. Did you have another question? Uh, yes, this one from Michael. Michael asks, I understand the concept of price memory, but is there any actual evidence that there is a significant probability that price will move in the future to a prior memory level? Uh, so um, I'm sure you can, uh, I, I'm sure there's, there's tons of back testing that can be done. I mean, let's just look at, um, I mean, let's look at uh, 2010, when the S&P was bumping along here, um, <laughs> I, I should look at what level this is. It's probably a hilarious level, right? It's like, where was the S&P? Oh, the S&P was at just above 1,000, right? Okay. And, and look how much time it spent there. Now, to me, this price memory is pretty important because we really spent four months, you know, trying to get above you know, trying to get out of the S&P 1000s, right? Mm -hmm. So when you spend four months there, that's some significant price memory. Like, I want to pay attention to that. And if the market had cr come down and crashed through that horizontal price memory, I might be concerned that, you know, there was something going on. But what did it do? I mean, the, uh, I don't know if you remember, in August of 2011, we had a 5% down day that we hadn't seen since the financial crisis. It was when, um, it was when we, uh, it was the debt ceiling debacle. All of a sudden mm -hmm. we, weren't gonna, we weren't gonna pay our, our, our foreign debt on our T-bonds. And oh no, there goes the credit rating of the US. Yes. And the S&P went from 1160 to 1100 in one day. 5% down move. So um, lots of panic there, but you know what? We couldn't even touch the, the price memory of, I think the low was 1075 here. In um, in October of 2011, and mm -hmm. you know, so 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 I I 
I want to go back to the person who asked the question and see if that helped at all or if they can ask it a different way and I can be more specific. Hmm. All was, right. that, was that from Michael? Uh, yes. So if Michael can just tell us in the chat if, if um, he's asking something different than I tried to answer. Um, yeah, you can go and back test all kinds of how often does the market come back, but you can also have your own risk reward calculation. I mean, based on four months of bouncing off of say, you know, just above S&P 1000 and then, and then getting up here and making a new high, I would have bet a lot of money to be a buyer like at S&P 1050. And in fact, I remember I was actually short. <laughs> I was short. I remember exactly where I was because I was I was doing a I was giving a lecture to a local college, like like we're doing now, and I had some triple leverage short positions on that I was that I was up really big on when the S and P plunged to ten seventy five, and I thought, well, I'm going to take those off at ten fifty. Never got the chance. The market immediately reversed higher, <laughs> and I had to close everything flat. But um, but I would have been a, a big buyer just against these levels, right? I mean, is that, is that something you teach Mike is like, I'm gonna lean on this support level and be a bigger buyer here because it should hold, but if it doesn't, I know where my stop is. So part of what I teach is to do a top-down analysis uh, of the market, uh, where you, uh, I kind of think of it as seasons and as uh, like looking at the forest the trees and down into the leaves right so you have the monthly right. charts looking at the weekly uh you can see the, uh what's happening on the daily and even on the intraday and uh, when we're thinking about it like like seasons uh, like season uh, like you could start to see certain things change uh, from like a leaf right well, like if you're walking through the forest and you see a leaf on the ground <sighs> Yeah, like that, that could be the first sign of change, but you wouldn't just pick up the leaf and say like, oh my God, winter's here, because you look up and it's like, oh, like everything else is green around me, right? Or you wouldn't just like pick up the leaf and then look at the tree and say that, oh, winter's here, because maybe the tree's just dead. It, it, it's the first signs, but you wanna uh, take a look at the bigger picture because you want, if you're only looking at the forest level, which would be the monthly view, then you're constantly going to be late to the party. Yeah, so yeah, I like the top down view. I mean, if, if, if the broad market is in a strong uptrend, then you don't spend a lot of time looking for short candidates. <laughs> right, right, unless, unless if uh, you're in some kind of a parabolic move, Right, uh, and you go through. Then you're going through your uh, your own watch list to see what are uh, the stocks that you're interested in. How are they setting up? Right, because uh, what we're looking at is uh, an index or an index of stocks. Right, it's not a stock market; it's a market of stocks. So, what are the stocks that are within it doing? And another indicator that I like to look at too is the number of stocks making up new highs versus new lows. Mm -hmm. So, so here's one thing: like, if we did, um, uh, do you know um, uh, Sven Heinrich, the Northman trader from London? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, he's uh, he's on Twitter and he's on CNBC a lot. Um, okay. He was calling for a collapse to S and P twenty two fifty or lower, just because he was just. He was fundamentally bearish, and then he thought the market was overextended. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we had gotten that, yeah, everybody would have come out and said, "Oh, the trend line saved the day." You know, the trend line saved the bull market if we had gone to say twenty three hundred or something. And there, you know, that would have been coincidence, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. This line connecting '09 and 2011 is is meaningless, and it wouldn't have been what saved the bull market if we had gone down there. So, so, it, so it's really an oversimplification of what's happening. Yeah. And at best, it's a, a secondary or tertiary uh, indicator and use other things to identify price behavior. I mean, yeah. I mean, and, and, and just look around you. If you don't want to study physics or weather, how about study options? People who, who, people who trade options should study the options Greeks. 
and learn what gamma is. Learn what delta is first, obviously, and then learn what gamma is. The, you know, the second derivative, the speed of the delta, right? Mm -hmm. That's why options have curvature. There are no straight lines in options. Everything about options is curvature, right? And um, that's the way the world works. Um, I don't know if you know the Black-Scholes model was built by quants who understood Brownian motion. So the Black-Scholes model is actually about fluid dynamics. There are no straight lines hmm. in options uh, or asset prices. And because what, are, what drives asset prices? Not sound, rational investment. Emotions, fear and greed. Yeah. So the most complex system on the planet are markets driven by emotions. And uh, that turbulence and that dynamism doesn't have any straight lines in it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that's why the history keeps on repeating itself. Going back to like uh, the, the 1890s, uh, you can still see the same kind of chart patterns uh, that you do today. It's why a guy like me that was working full time can eventually learn this stuff and quit the day job and now do this. Uh, and there's lots of other stories like that too. You got any more questions from your, uh, your people? Um, let's see. <laughs> Uh, no, it looks like that's it uh, okay. on the question side. If you guys have uh, any other how, questions, like how much, how much time do we have left? Uh, we've got five minutes. Okay. Uh, I think that if there's time for one more, um, get it in. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so I just wanted to, to uh, share a related uh, theme. Do you have? Do you ever encounter any of your new traders? who start trading uh, the VIX products, like say UVXY or VXX? Uh, I have not yet, no. Most of the people that are coming to me, they're coming to me for first with, uh, for mindset. Okay. Uh, that, that, that's the most important thing yeah, so, uh, in trading. So uh, uh, remember that, uh, you know, it was in the, in the, <clears throat> in the winter, early spring of 2018, we had that whole um, VIX apocalypse, you know, where the, everybody who was short the VIX products, all of a sudden it blew up and uh, uh, there was a firm in Chicago that, that lost tens of millions of dollars. But when individual traders get into trading the VIX products, this is where math is really important and understanding options because something like uh, VXX or UVXY is a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. Mm -hmm. And when you start getting into that, when you start getting into third and fourth derivatives of some underlying, um, you know, you lose touch with the mechanics that actually move it very fast. So, so for instance, I'll just, I'll just throw up a chart of, we'll do VXX since it's not leveraged. So here's VXX. Um, let's see, the all time high back in uh, 09 <laughs> was, $120,000. Now, most people would say, well, it's never going back there, but let's not be that dramatic. Let's do something like, um, let's look at it on a one week basis. Okay. Oh, as recently as 2018, <clears throat> it went up to almost $40. Okay. <clears throat> now I know traders who think, oh, this market, it's gonna peak soon. You wanna buy volatility and you're gonna make a killing when the VIX goes to 25 or the VIX goes to 30, you know? This thing will shoot back up to 40. And the truth is, is that VXX is not going back to 40 because of the way it's constructed, because it's a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. Um, and and so, so let's go through the chain. And the VIX is a derivative of S&P options, right? And S&P options are obviously a derivative of the S&P. But then all these VIX products are built on the futures that are built on the VIX. And, you know, that's where you start getting further and further away from what creates them. Um, and, and they have a built-in tendency to go to zero. They have this natural decay because the, the futures curve looks like this. So they're always having to um, buy futures and then sell them and then buy a higher future, you know. Sell, buy, sell, buy, all the way up 
on the VIX futures curve. So that creates this natural erosion decay where these instruments will go to zero. So this is an, another place that you know traders need to do a little math before they before they bet on a volatility explosion. Yeah, the, it's really really interesting stuff, there. and it's well one of the reasons why, why too. Well, I like there's so many instruments that, that we could trade. Like, well, why bother with this? Right. You could bother right. With the, like just go to something that that's simplistic. That that uh, you know, like go, why make things more complicated than right. they need? So anyway, um, I think that that's all the time to, that we have. All right. Uh, well, we got to do this again, and we got to we got to do a bigger um, gathering of folks. See if we can get like you know thirty, forty folks on here. Yeah, absolutely. We can get more questions. Uh, well, thank you so much, Kevin, for coming on here, giving us the the time. Super uh, educational. Really, really appreciate it. I uh, want to say thank you to everybody that, that joined us here live. And yeah, look forward to doing this again really, really soon. Everybody check out Kevin and all of his work. Uh, check out that Medium post. It will be in the show notes. Check out the video uh, and everything else that, that Kevin has going on at Zach's, uh, on Twitter, on StockTwits. Where else can people find you? Oh, that's about it. I, I'm not much of an Instagram person. So it's, uh, it's Twitter and StockTwits. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks again, Kevin. All right. Thanks, Michael. Take care.